Now the serpent was more crafty than any of the wild animals the Lord God had made. He said to the woman, did God really say you must not eat from any tree in the garden? The woman said to the serpent, we may eat fruit from the trees in the garden. But God did say, you must not eat fruit from the tree that is in the middle of the garden, and you must not touch it or you will die. You will not certainly die, the serpent said to the woman, for God knows that when you eat from it, your eyes will be opened and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. When the woman saw that the fruit of the tree was good for food and pleasing to the eye, and also desirable for gaining wisdom, she took some and ate it. She also gave some to her husband, who was with her, and he ate it. Then the eyes of both of them were opened, and they realized they were naked. So they sewed fig leaves together and made coverings for themselves. Then the man and his wife heard the sound of the Lord God as he was walking in the garden in the cool of the day. And they hid from the Lord God among the trees of the garden. <laughs> uh, great, thanks. Thanks, Sam. Uh, let me pray again before we begin. Lord, thank you for this time to study your word. I pray that you'd speak to us by your word and spirit so that we may know uh, who we are better and we may know who you are better. We pray that you would lift us up in the name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. Uh, well, God made the crafty snake, uh, our first point. Uh, temptation, uh, the origin of evil, is a complicated matter. Uh, Genesis 1, verse 31, a couple of chapters back, God saw that all he had made, and it was very good. God made all, and he saw that it was very good. And yet, who made the crafty snake, or the cunning snake? God did. Genesis 3, verse 1. Now, the snake was more crafty than any of the wild animals the Lord God had made. Uh, what about the object of temptation in this short passage, the fruit of the tree? Who, who put that there? Well, God did. Chapter 2, verse 8 and 9, now the Lord God had planted a garden in the east, a few uh, sentences later, in the middle of the garden were the tree of life and the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Sin and evil did not enter our world in some kind of tragic failure of God's good creation. It's not out of his control. It's not beyond his sovereignty or some colossal failure of his rule. Who created the crafty snake? God did. But why and how? How can a good God allow temptation? How can the tempter even exist in a good creation? Uh, we learn later in the Bible that the snake here in Genesis is really Satan, uh, the devil himself, revealing himself in the form of a talking snake. It's on the screen, Revelation 12, verse 9. Uh, speaking of the end times, the great dragon was held down. The ancient snake, another name for him, called the devil or Satan, who leads the whole world astray, as we're about to see. He was held to the earth and his angels with him. How can God allow this to come about if he is good? To us, a, a fallen and a, a sinful humanity as we're about to discuss discover we cannot understand fully how god can be good and yet allow evil at the same time uh, but that does not mean that it's not so and in fact it surely has to be one of our greatest comforts to know that even uh, though there is evil it is under the authority and sovereignty and control of god otherwise what hope would we have what use would God be if he can't ultimately, ultimately bring full justice and peace to all things? If he's lost control, he's no God at all. Now, we may struggle to get our heads around this, uh, but it is a cause for us to rejoice that in a turbulent world, God is in full control. Uh, Joseph was uh, the youngest of 12 brothers, and he was favoured by his father, 
uh, Jacob living in Israel. And the 11 brothers grew so jealous that they ended up nearly killing Joseph in the fields one day. Uh, but instead, they decided they'd profiteer off him and they sold Joseph to a passing slave trader. Uh, jo Joseph was taken off into slavery. Uh, he was accused falsely of various crimes. He was imprisoned. Uh, but ultimately, he worked his way up within Egypt to be a, in a fairly senior position in this foreign land. Now, it, it was shocking, sinful behavior by his brothers. Uh, they even told his father when they got home that day that they'd seen him killed by, uh, by a wild animal. Uh, it's, it's misery. There's evil, there's lies, it's everywhere. Why would God allow this evil? How could a good God allow this to happen to Joseph and his father? But, well, eventually there was a great famine in the Middle East and in Northeast Africa. Uh, but God had already guided Joseph to persuade Pharaoh at the time uh, to stockpile food in anticipation of his this famine. And so who comes knocking at the door of Egypt? Well, the Israelites, Joseph's brothers. And when, they, when the brothers finally realize and work out that in fact it's their brother that they sold into slavery who is in charge and governing the food distribution, you can imagine their fear. This is not going to go well. But here is what Joseph said. If you hadn't realized it, so it's a story from later on in Genesis. Genesis 50. You intended to harm me, said Joseph, but God intended it to accomplish what is now being done, the saving of many lives. So then don't be afraid. I will provide for you and your children. And he reassured them and spoke kindly to them. God allows evil, but is not responsible for it. The 11 brothers chose badly and freely to do evil. And yet God, in his sovereign control, allows the evil to take place. Man is fully accountable for their sin. And yet the goodness of God is clearly at work. So we must trust as we get into this passage in Genesis that God allows temptation. He allows the fall of mankind. And he will one day show us his good in it. He will one day make it a glorious sense to us. So God allowed evil, yet is in complete control. God is not responsible morally for our sin. We are. We're free. Yet he will bring goodness out of it for his name and for those who call out to him for mercy, as the brothers did to Joseph. What a great joy to know that God is in control. So let's continue. Uh, the tactics of temptation. Number one, temptation pretends to be your friend. Have a look at verse one again. He, that's the snake, said to the woman, did God really say... You must not eat from any tree in the garden. Oh, where to think, thinks the crafty snake. Where to start, sorry. Uh, well, well, let's start by just slightly twisting God's word and asking a question. Now, of course, the original word that God had given to Adam uh, back in chapter 2, verse 16, said this, the Lord God commanded the man, you are free to eat from any tree in the garden, but you must not eat from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, for when you eat from it, you will certainly die. But it's, it's, it's almost a seemingly innocent question, isn't it? Are you sure, God said, and, and let's just twist it a little bit. And it draws Eve in. Uh, this snake seems okay, just wants to know a bit more about God. Maybe he's even on our side. Before he realizes it, She's engaged and interacting with temptation. Uh, now, there are telltale signs. Uh, for example, this is the first ever conversation about God rather than with God. It's also a subtle questioning, and it, it sows a slight seed of doubt. Did God really say? 
but it's safe at the moment. So verse two, the woman said to the snake, we may eat from the trees. My time's up. <laughs> <laughs> we may eat from the we may eat fruit from the trees in the garden. Well, so far, so good. Verse three. But God did say, you must not eat from the tree that is in the middle of the garden and you must not touch it or you will die. Now, maybe Adam hadn't taught Eve the full word of God. Maybe he hadn't taught her well or correctly because uh, he was the one given the command. Or, or maybe Eve, in a bid to defend the Lord God, she kind of over eggs his commands a little bit. Just don't even touch it. I'm not, we're not allowed or we'll die. Whatever it is, not knowing the full word of God is an open door for temptation and Satan. Uh, and the door is now open. And it's time for an undermining move from the tempter. So number two, temptation questions the word and goodness of God. Have a look at verse four. You'll not certainly die, the snake said to the woman. Die, that, that's a little bit extreme, Eve. You won't die, says the snake. We'll come back to that. But verse five, for God knows that when you eat from it, your eyes will be opened and you'll be like God. Knowing good and evil. God's not going to bring you death. He's just, you know, just a little bit of a meanie. He just wants to keep you at arm's length in case you kind of gain the same wisdom and knowledge and power as he does. The tempter opens the door and, and he, he draws Eve in. He, he sows the seeds of doubt about what she has heard and knows from God's word. Are you, are you sure? I think God's just being a bit mean here. God's not quite as good as you thought. Now, Jesus gets tempted in the same way in Matthew chapter 4, verse 2 and 3. Jesus, after fasting for 40 days and nights, he was hungry. Fairly obvious. The tempter came to him and said, if you're the son of God, tell, tell these stones to become bread. He opens the door. He pretends he's his friend. Anyone's going to be hungry after 40 days and 40 nights. It's, it's all right to eat a little. It begins with God's word again. God wouldn't deny you his good promises, would he? If you just turn this bread to stone. Temptation starts with a, a drawing in and then a questioning of God's goodness and word. That's not surprising that the warnings in the New Testament about false teachers who might lead God's people astray, who might tempt them away from the Lord Jesus, they all come from within the church. So 2 Peter 2 verse 1, but there were also false prophets among you, just as there will be false teachers among you. They will secretly introduce destructive heresies, even denying the sovereign Lord who brought them bringing swift destruction on themselves. Jesus puts it like this, Matthew 7, 15, watch out for false prophets. They come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly they are ferocious wolves. The reason it's so tempting to believe Satan's lies is because he, he draws us in and then he just pushes against God's word and God's goodness. Are we ready? Or like Eve, will we fall? 2 Timothy 4, 3, for the time will come when people will not put up with sound doctrine. Instead, to suit their own desires, they will gather around them a great number of teachers to say what their itching ears want to hear. Because Eve didn't know and trust the word of God well enough, She's forgotten God's wonderful goodness and instead started to think of her own glory. The antidote to, to temptation is God's word, for it reminds us of God's goodness. How far could the snake's lies be from the truth, yet we've got there ever so quickly and easily? God's a spoil sport. He's a bit mean. He's... He's keeping a higher place for himself and at humanity's expense. 
when the full truth is that God in his abundance and goodness has given Adam and Eve absolutely everything they need. You're free, he said, to eat any of the fruits, all of it. Adam told, was told this, a world full of freedom, of goodness, to enjoy all that God had made and created, and just one simple no. And even that one simple no we trust was for their good. I know what's best for you, says God. Let me demonstrate that you must trust me by just giving you one no. Everything you need, full and good. Just one tree to remind you to trust me. But no, I care for you. I give you everything. I know what is best. God is good, according to his word and command that he gives to Adam and Eve. But when we doubt it, well, Satan is crouching at the door. And so we should return to God's word in our Bibles. We should see his truth. We should remind ourselves of his goodness on every page. Number three, temptation denies God's judgment. We've seen it already in verse four. But temptation is always a denial at one level of God's judgment. We have to justify when we sin that God's judgment is not to be taken too seriously, don't we? It's the central focus of Satan's temptation for Eve. You will not surely die. The denial of God's judgment is sadly always on the tips of our lips when we fight to justify our actions or, or to play down God's word. Well, God made me like this, so surely he can't judge me for being it. Or, or oh, God will forgive me if I, if I just do this one more time. It's a denial of God's judgment, isn't it? That it, it just doesn't matter. You won't surely die. From the first temptation to the last, Satan will keep on trying to fool the world that God will not judge. Death will not really come. How sad and how far from the truth, as we'll see next week. But there is an eternal death of right punishment, a, a breakdown, as we'll see in a minute, completely of our relationship between God and us. And it awaits those who sin and do not find forgiveness in Jesus. We'll face the same end as the serpent, as Satan himself. Revelation 20 verse 10. The devil who deceived them was thrown into the lake of burning sulfur, where the beast and the false prophet had been thrown. They'll be tormented day and night forever and ever. That's what Satan denies is going to happen. And it tempts us in. Verse 15 of Revelation 20. It's not just for him. Anyone whose name was not found written in the book of, the, of life. In other words, anyone who hasn't turned in repentance and faith in the Lord Jesus. For the forgiveness of their sins. Will also be thrown into that eternal lake. Do not be tempted to deny God's judgment. will make it far too easy to reject God. It will make it far too easy for those around us who look in and look at our lives and go, well, we don't really need Jesus because there's nothing terrible coming. There's no judgment to come. I'll do it my way, thanks. Satan loves to deny God's judgment. And when we start to entertain that, the fourth thing becomes true. Temptation is tempting. Well, maybe thinks that even in, in my ignorance of God's word, that the snake, maybe he's got a point. She forgets her true joy and all her goodness is given to her freely by God. She starts to question his very judgment about the one command he's given. He forgets the wonderful goodness that he's given to her. And she discovers that the moment you forget God's word and goodness, then the worldly attractiveness of sin becomes just that, 
attractive, tempting. Verse 6 in our passage, when the woman saw that the fruit of the tree was good for food, pleasing to the eye, and also desirable for gaining wisdom, she took some and she ate it. She also gave some to her husband who was with her, and he ate it. The fruit is going to be, verse 6, it's good for the body, it's good for the eye, it's even good for our heads and gaining wisdom. She begins to trust herself over the word of God. Sin is always this way. With our head full of God's word, reminding us of God's goodness, we see sin and the fruit and, and we can ignore it. So we've got something so much better over here. God is our delight and our joy. But once we entertain temptation, and once we begin to question God's word and his, therefore his goodness and, and, and downplay his judgment, we forget his goodness and how sweet that sin looks. It's hard to know what to make of Adam at this point. Uh, the text seems to imply that he was with her. Uh, maybe he listened to the whole conversation. Uh, maybe he was close by, didn't hear the conversation, but simply accepted the temptation of putting his wife before the Lord God. And maybe his failure was not teaching the full word of God to his wife that God had given him. Maybe he just didn't think. Temptation, you see, comes warmly and friendly, even drawing us in by God's word itself, perhaps. Or perhaps in Adam's case, preys on an unsuspecting and an idle heart and life. It then challenges God's word. It highlights our ignorance of God's word and it, it causes us to forget God's goodness. It's a, it denies the unfathomable freedom we have in God's goodness. It, it denies God's coming judgment for rebellion against him. And the consequences, well, they are very sad and very serious. At last, I point to see, uh, sin destroys all relationships. Uh, Adam and Eve, of course, are, are like forerunners, states people for all of humanity. And their sin opened our eyes, in a sense, to exactly what Satan promised, knowing good and evil. So verse 7, then the eyes of both of them were opened and they realized that they were naked. So they sewed fig leaves together and made coverings for themselves. And knowledge of good and evil means Adam and Eve instantly realize that they have rejected God and his command. And so they are ashamed. That wonderful innocence of Adam and Eve's marriage at the end of chapter 2, verse 25, Adam and, Eve, Adam and his wife were both naked and they felt no shame, is instantly ruined by sin. Sin destroys human relationships. Instead of only living for the glory of God, which they were doing, who provides us with every, every good thing we need and creates a perfect unity within amongst ourselves, when we sin, we claim God's self uh, God's place for ourselves, which is what Eve was doing and Adam did, knowing I'm in charge now. And that can never work on a human level, can it? With every person being their own God? It's, it's shameful. We've got to hide ourselves from each other now. But secondly, it ruins our relationship with God. Uh, verse 8, uh, which we'll include in next week's reading as well, but it's helpful here. Then the man and his wife heard the sound of the Lord God as, as he was walking in the garden in the cool of the day, and they hid from the Lord God among the trees of the garden. But that denial of God's judgment has come back to bite, hasn't it? They are now afraid, says verse 10 of chapter 3, of God. Rightly so. The God of all creation, who has graciously and generously given them this wonderful garden and all the goodness that they need to live under his loving care. Well, they have rejected that wholesale. The Lord God has returned and found someone else sitting on his throne. Sin ruins all relationships, both with each other and with God. 
And we're now ashamed of each other and we're rightly afraid of God. God has become our rival. He's now our enemy. And he will judge. We cannot help it. We belong to Adam. <coughs> it's who we are. And when we're honest with ourselves, we know it's true. We will always choose to eat of our own will and not his. Romans 5 verse 12, therefore, just as sin entered the world through one man, that's Adam, and death through sin, and in this way death came to all people because all sinned. Finally then, we, we need some hope, don't we? Take and eat. This is why we need Jesus. This is why he is such good news to us. Of course, we're now afraid of God in his judgment. But isn't it quite simply extraordinary that God, despite our <laughs> denial of his goodness, keeps coming? He, he unrelentingly pursues us to show us and remind us that he is good again. In fact, is not the goodness of God even more vividly and wonderfully displayed to all of humanity? Now we know what our true colors are like. You and I belong to Adam. We choose the same way as him. Like Eve, verse 6, we took and ate judgment upon ourselves. Yet here comes a good and wonderful God who gives of himself again in the person of Jesus, to right our wrongs. Continuing in Romans, Paul says this in verse 17 of chapter 5, For if by the trespass of one man death reigned through that one man, how much more will those who receive God's abundant provision of grace and of the gift of righteousness reign in life through the one man, Jesus Christ? Consequently, just as one trespass resulted in condemnation uh, for all people, so also one righteous act resulted in justification and life for all people. For well, just as through the disobedience of the one man, the many were made sinners, so also through the obedience of the one man, the many will be made righteous. Jesus lived in perfect obedience where well, we did not. He did not take and eat. Instead, in perfect obedience, takes upon himself the fear and the shame and the judgment we deserve. He, in fact, so obviously re reverses the sin of taking and eating the fruit of sin that now in he, he, instead he says, take and eat my own flesh and blood. Yours is sinful by human nature, your, your flesh and blood. Say can eat mine. Mine is righteous <clears throat> and free. Mine is in wonderful, perfect relationship with the Father, the God of goodness. Take and eat my, uh, not take and eat, not sin, but the body and blood of Jesus. We began by wondering why God could allow evil and still be good. Is this it? But in our sin, which we willingly choose and are responsible for before God, that in our sin we truly see, Ephesians 3.18, how wide and long and high and deep is the love of Christ. That we may know his love that surpasses knowledge, that we may be filled to the measure of all the fullness of God. Let's pray. Father, by your spirit, we pray that you would open our hearts to humbly repent before you for each temptation we have entertained and each sin 
you have followed through and forgive us that we have taken and eat judgment, eaten judgment upon ourselves against your good and glorious will, your commands and your goodness. We are rightly ashamed and we rightly fear your judgment. And so we give you great thanks that despite who we are, you pursue us in your goodness so that we may take and eat of the body of Christ so that we may have his righteousness in our place so that we may remember how wide and long and deep and high his love is for us. Remind us of your goodness through your word today, we pray, so that we may live in perfect union with you, trusting in the Lord Jesus and enjoying him today and forever. Amen. Amen. We're going to sing our final song, uh, which uh, reminds us of God's goodness to us in the Lord Jesus.